And welcome to the Overland Park Chamber of Commerce Virtual Town Hall with Senator Jerry Moran. We are excited to have everyone online today to have our uh, conversation. And uh, Senator, thank you very much for joining us today. Tracy, um, I'm pleased to be with you. Thanks for the chambers. Uh, I don't know whether we invited ourselves. If we did, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. If it was your idea, thank you for extending it. I'm uh, pleased to be here this afternoon. I am in Washington, D.C., and the Senate is in session. Uh, you'll lose me at about 5.30 here, 4.30 your time when uh, votes are called, but I'm glad to spend some time and have a conversation with uh, Overland Park Chamber of Commerce members, and I appreciate the friendship and relationship we have with you and your team. Well, we are always happy to see you, and, and you are welcome to invite yourself anytime. Just consider that an open invitation, um, whether it's in person at, at the Chamber or uh, virtually. Uh, so we have a, a few items of housekeeping, and then we're going to dive right in because we are cognizant that, that uh, you are on a, a tight time schedule. Uh, first, we want to thank um, our corporate partners, sponsors, and leadership circle members, their investment every day toward our vision of making Overland Park uh, prosper um, is extremely important to us. And you saw that screen uh, when uh, you were getting ready to, to join our roundtable today. And also, we want to thank and recognize FNBO, First National Bank of Omaha, for sponsoring our virtual event. And uh, they've been very generous in, in sponsoring a number of our virtual events um, during uh, this uh, particular uh, time that we're in. Um, a couple of housekeeping items, uh, just to remember, you know, this is a webinar. So all attendees, um, other than those who are participating um, in uh, the remarks, are automatically muted. Uh, we know that you'll have questions uh, for Senator Moran, and so please enter those in the Q&A feature. You'll find that in the control panel at the bottom of your screen. So please submit questions that you have for the Senator there. And our Senior Vice President of Public Policy, Kevin Walker, is going to be moderating that session at the conclusion of the Senator's uh, remarks. Um, so I'm not sure that uh, Senator Moran needs any introduction. Uh, so I'm going to make just a, a couple of quick comments uh, of, of really welcome rather than introduction. Um, most of you all know uh, when he was elected to the Senate, joining uh, us in uh, 2010 uh, in uh, that role. And he really has been an, a leading advocate for a number of issues that are so important, not just to um, our community, but particularly to our chamber community, uh, primarily around um, the issues of entrepreneurship, um, workforce, education, job creation, and innovation. And uh, he has been such a great friend to Johnson County, to Overland Park, and of course to one of our major issues of priority, uh, the expansion of US 69. And so um, we are so excited to have um, you with us, Senator Moran, and also of course, um, Alex Richard, uh, who is joining us, um, a key member of, of your staff team who is um, so good uh, to work with us, um, really kind of boots on the ground. Um, so Alex, welcome to you as well. It's, it's nice to see you in person um, a, as it is. Uh, so um, I'm going to just turn it over uh, to you, uh, Jerry. Uh, take it away and uh, give us the, the update straight from DC. Tracy, the, you said lots of nice things. Thank you very much. The nicest was you called me Jerry and I appreciate that. Uh, I do wanna be part of the community and want to do everything I can to make sure that uh, Johnson County, Overland Park, and really our entire state has a level of prosperity. And I thought we were on a path uh, in that regard. Uh, understand the importance of a number of issues. Thanks for highlighting entrepreneurship. Uh, we've also been working to try to increase the, the technical education, the availability of engineers, uh, those who like science, mathematics, uh, and research to have opportunities in, uh, in Kansas, particularly in the, I would guess, in the eastern part of our state. And uh, we have a, had a, a, a strong working relationship with a lot of your business uh, members uh, of the chamber. And Alex, you're right to introduce Alex, my state director. Alex was the legislative director here in Washington, D.C., so therefore knows uh, how we do things, the, how we operate here. But he was a part of the, cre the, the creator of how we do things and had a responsibility for all the issues that we deal with. So you all ought to put uh, Alex to, uh, to work in, in my absence when I'm not in front of you. So. Um, we, I think we we're on a path to some prosperity and, and along came COVID-19. Uh, I would be uh, easily, uh, it was easily for me to admit that uh, we were not well prepared for a pandemic as a country. Uh, I think probably Americans thought that uh, this is something that happens someplace else. Uh, and uh, probably Kansans thought it happened someplace else. 
and we are not immune from, uh, from forces around the globe, uh, particularly when they relate to our health. And uh, we started a little flat-footed uh, in this regard when it became clear that the pandemic was going to be in the United States and was going to be in Kansas. And so my primary uh, efforts have been twofold, and, and often they are related. Uh, fighting COVID-19 from a health perspective, uh, trying to slow its spread, trying to give our healthcare providers uh, a chance to catch up and to, to be in a position in which they can uh, be well protected as, as uh, employees, uh, as healthcare providers, but also to make certain they had the tools necessary to combat the virus uh, in all of their patients. Uh, and that involves some economic challenges uh, and particularly to some degree the, the social distancing, but to a much greater degree when it uh, became uh, the order of the day that we were going to have stay at home uh, orders. Uh, that had a huge consequence on our, uh, our nation's economy and it had a huge impact upon individual businesses and their employees. Uh, and so a number of programs, what I call three and a half phases of legislation have been passed in Washington DC. We're now working on what the fourth phase should look like. Uh, I've been a supporter, I voted for all three and a half phases somewhat out of character, because uh, I certainly believe that if the federal government is too big, intrudes too often, spends too much money, keeps growing too fast, uh, and yet these uh, three and a half phases, and the fourth one will uh, continue that, what I think is a un an undesirable nature of the federal government, but I, in my view, what we face with a pandemic, people, businesses, employees, families, just all of us are affected in ways that, uh, I mean, we didn't, we didn't cause the problem uh, and we need to do things to improve people's health well-being as well as take care of their economic well-being. That doesn't mean that the sources of federal programs and taxpayer dollars or more uh, accurately borrowed money is something that can continue ad infinitum. Uh, there are consequences to this level of spending. There are consequences to debt and deficit. Uh, and we need to be uh, judicious and um, perhaps more responsible, but certainly responsible as we look at what we do next. And I'm happy to have the conversation with members of the Overland Park Chamber about what they think uh, that right balance is and what they think the programs uh, and spending uh, should be uh, for. Um, uh, again, this isn't things that I normally would, would have, uh, have voted for in the, in the magnitude and scope of the federal government. And my goal at the, at, when, when this is quote behind us is to see if we can't get our level of spending back down to what it was before we started uh, combating COVID-19, uh, that we don't have now a new baseline in which all spending increases from that point. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hoping that we can do things uh, to, to, to compensate for the money that was necessarily spent. There are provisions in all three and a half phases, all four pieces of legislation, that I didn't really like, uh, but I was pleased to see that none of us saw this as we have to have everything exactly as to what, like we want it, uh, or we're not supporting it. In fact, uh, the CARES Act, the, the phase three, that is the largest and probably the most, uh, in many ways, the most significant legislative effort passed the Senate 96 to zero, something that does not happen in today's uh, political or um, even just across the country kind of way people look at what goes on in the nation's capital. And it was good, I think, a message for Americans that we were together in this regard. Uh, probably the, the most significant component of that piece of legislation was the Paycheck Protection Program, and I'd be, I would be surprised if there aren't questions about it. So I'll save that topic for uh, when people uh, uh, request a, a conversation about it. I also would say that our office, Alex and others, uh, and as well as you know me personally, have been involved in significant efforts trying to get personal protection equipment, uh, certainly to hospitals and first responders and police departments and ambulance services, public health departments, uh, but also just to businesses as well. Uh, and we've been a, a strong advocate, I'm a strong advocate for testing uh, and more availability of testing. And uh, of course the solution that is most desirable is a vaccine. Uh, not too long ago, maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks ago, Francis Collins, Dr. Francis Collins, the head of the National Institute of Health, uh, the federal uh, agency that has been tasked with uh, coordinating and pursuing a vaccine. Uh, I had him on a similar kind of call to this with healthcare professionals, medical researchers at the University of Kansas uh, and others. Uh, and 
the message he delivered, which I would would interpret what the, the, the scientists and the medical providers in the audience, the way they, they described what he was saying was uh, with excitement that uh, the potential for a vaccine by October or November. And while we're pursuing, while they are pursuing uh, a significant number of vaccines, potential solutions to this, uh, this COVID-19 virus, at the same time we're pursuing what the virus, what the vaccine should be, excuse me, at the same time we are pursuing what the vaccine should be, we're also beginning the process of manufacturing those vaccines, even though we don't know which one it may turn out to be the, the correct one, the one that has uh, efficacy, we're going to be in a position, at least that's the goal, to be in the position that we're already manufacturing at the same time we're trying to determine, so that when we do determine what the vaccine is, we are prepared for manufacturing. A couple of takeaways for me, and then I'll turn it over to Kevin and the questions. Uh, for me, a, a takeaway is that we need a to devote more resources to our public health departments. Uh, the first place, the first call I made as this developed was a statewide uh, conference call with the, the county health nurses, the county health directors uh, across Kansas. Uh, and in my view, they have been um, poorly resourced. Mostly it's a I mean, it's easy, I suppose, for me to say it's poorly resourced because they are county and funded by the state, but there's a significant amount of money that goes to county health departments through the Center for Disease Control. And uh, so that, that is something I think we ought to spend more time on. I also think we cannot ignore um, trying to help countries uh, that are more, a lot more impoverished than us uh, to fight uh, pandemics that start there. Uh, and by that, I'm not talking about China, but Ebola and other places that, uh, in Africa. Uh, public health is important worldwide, and we have a role to play. And then the second thing I would say as a takeaway, we need to bring home, we need to source uh, our manufacturing for medical devices, medical equipment, for vaccines, for drugs, for pharmaceuticals, for reagents, for swabs, for personal protection equipment uh, back in the United States. We discovered as we were trying to find PPE for hospitals and public health departments and others across Kansas that often whatever they had ordered was coming from China and it was sitting on some dock in Los Angeles at the port, uh, unable to clear an FDA approval because it did not meet US standards. There is, uh, in my view, a, a, a significant reason that we should be more reliant upon ourselves and a lot less reliant upon China which uh, often is our adversary. And in times of crisis, I don't want to be uh, relying upon them for the solution to our challenges. So it may create opportunities in Overland Park, Kansas, uh, for us to do more. It's a place that already pharmaceuticals, uh, medicines, drug testing, tests are being uh, manufactured. Uh, we have the opportunity to expand and to grow uh, in the United States, uh, those kind of uh, manufacturing and processing opportunities. And I, I would think that uh, Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development folks ought to be looking for uh, ways to bring that business, not only to the United States, but to Kansas uh, as well. And Kevin and, and Tracy, I'm happy to take the conversation whatever direction you all would like for it to go. Well, Senator, thanks so much for those comments. Uh, as you can imagine, a number of the questions that, that have come in have uh, related to the uh, pandemic and the economic impact, and then uh, a few others related to that. I'm gonna get a couple broader themes out of the way first. Uh, one of them is specific, uh, your thoughts on if we're headed for a trade war with China and the impact that might have on the Kansas economy with our ag economy and whatnot. Well, I, I appreciate that question and I appreciate an ag focus and it's, uh, it's pleasing to me that wherever you live in Kansas, you recognize that what happens in agriculture has a consequence to our entire state. Most of us, a uh, vast majority of us are not farmers or ranchers, but we have significant consequences to the Kansas economy when, um, when we're unable to earn a profit in agriculture. But I would, I would take this conversation broader. Uh, Kansas earns a living by what we export. We manufacture and we produce, uh, and we manufacture more than we can consume in the United States. We grow and produce more than we can eat and consume in the United States. And where we make a living in our state, from agriculture to aviation, is by what we sell around the world and a significant uh, customer of ours is China. And I just had a conversation, I asked, uh, I, uh, I have a relationship with um, uh, the trade ambassador, USTR uh, Lighthizer, 
uh, and uh, we were on a phone call together now 10 days ago with the same kind of question, what is it that I need to be doing to be helpful to make certain that the wheels don't come off of the, the, the latest announcement, uh, the phase of, um, of China beginning to buy more agriculture commodities? What do we do, despite what I said earlier about not being able to rely or trust China for our healthcare needs, what do we do to kind of calm the waters and keep the relationship that we have going in regard to agricultural trade and other trade uh, on track? And um, our, China is, has not complied with its, with its uh, agreement. Uh, the, the steps toward uh, re-engagement have not bought all the agriculture commodities that they have uh, promised to buy to date. But in the last several months, they're in, they are increasing that, pr those purchases dramatically. Uh, and so there is a belief by USTR that they have the chance to get back uh, on the path to, to comply with what they agreed to buy, to buy in a si significant enough volumes uh, to, to be compliant with that agreement. And so it is important that we make clear uh, to those who, in the White House, my colleagues in, uh, in the Senate, uh, about the importance of trade. And while we can have differences with China, there is uh, an opportunity for us to continue to earn a living by what we export. So that's the goal at the moment is to reduce a bit of the, uh, the opportunity. Don't, don't, I guess here's the way I'd say it, Kevin. We have to be careful we don't create the excuse for China to walk away from what they agreed to do and to keep them in, uh, on the path of uh, agriculture and other purchases uh, from the United States, from our producers and from our manufacturers. So uh, just a little bit of, uh, of, of doing things well uh, to keep China from having the opportunity to say, we did something wrong, the United States, keep them in, on the path of, of complying with their, what they agreed to do. Thank you for that. Um, Another broader question. Somebody's just curious uh, what the uh, the environment is like outside uh, your office building, and whether it's uh, you know as we're seeing it on the evening news, or you know how how are things in D.C. at the moment? Well, <clears throat> the um, I, I'm back in in Washington D.C. as I said uh, in the intro, uh, and uh, the Senate has been in session now for four or five weeks, so I'm back to flying. I was in Kansas City this morning. Uh, boarding an airplane at, uh, at mid-continent. Uh, the volume is growing. I didn't find, well, first of all, there used to be five flights a day, Kevin, two on Southwest and two on American that were nonstop to Reagan. All of those went away. This week, uh, this is the first week I've been able to fly a nonstop flight to, to, to Reagan uh, from Kansas City. Uh, but on that plane, there was only eight passengers. So we're not uh, back to where uh, by a long shot where we were before. In Washington, D.C., uh, it, is, it is a bit challenging as a United States Senate to operate, certainly not in our normal way. So when, we have, when the vote is called uh, this evening, uh, it will last longer than usual to allow fewer senators to be on the, on the Senate floor, on the chamber floor at one time. So we'll vote in longer periods of time to distance ourselves. We still have a what we call a policy lunch in which Republican senators get together every Tuesday for lunch to discuss mostly policy issues, legislative endeavors. And um, those meetings are now, the tables are spread in, a, in an auditorium size room and to speak, you go to a microphone. So we're distant. So again, odd things. I've not seen most of my staff. Every once in a while, one of them wanders in the office. Uh, they are working uh, from home. Uh, but I've not seen my staff since uh, the first part of March uh, in the office. So when I'm here, I generally have the office to myself, and I wouldn't want them to think that I've become accustomed to that and like it. Uh, I'm anxious for their return uh, so that we can do. I I'm still of the view that while technology can provide us with lots of tools to, to accomplish lots of things, there's still great value to all of us in personal relationships, and that's hard to have. Uh, in the distance, even when it is as, as effective or as, uh, as, as technologically capable as what we're doing right now. I'd rather be in Overland Park and have a conversation with you uh, at the Doubletree. So it is uh, a, it's an odd, odd thing here. As far as the, the, the demonstrations, um, uh, I, 
I mean, there, there, I think things over the last few days in Washington, D.C. have been, there are protests and there are demonstrations, rightfully so, uh, but they have uh, moderated in the, in the level of violence or destruction uh, that occurred for a few nights uh, early here in the nation's capital, but across uh, the country as well. And uh, I, I would use this as an opportunity to say that there are, there are grievances, there are um, certainly the, the death of Mr. Floyd uh, and the lack of racial justice that that indicates uh, is worthy of a response from the American people. Uh, we, gotta, we gotta listen, learn, and get it right and make changes. So I don't have any objection to people protesting, uh, but it does seem that we're now getting back to where it is about trying to make the case for change as compared to try to destroy something. Thank you. I'm going to uh, put the focus back on some of the uh, pandemic and the response and get you your feedback to some of the questions that have come in in that regard. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the $600 unemployment benefit and, and whether you think there's any chance that'll get extended? Uh, the way you ask the question, it sounds like someone is preferring that it be extended. There are lots of challenges that were created by the $600 additional unemployment benefit. Um, and in fact, while I indicated earlier that the CARES Act passed 96 to zero, one of the things that there was a separate vote on was an amendment to remove the $600 additional unemployment insurance benefit. A reminder that unemployment insurance is not a federal issue. Uh, we wandered into a, a state issue uh, and we did it in a couple of ways, but uh, we were trying to do something that would utilize uh, a system that was already in existence so that we were not reinventing a new program that required new paperwork, new infrastructure, new personnel, a new agency. Uh, it's, it's true, for example, of the other, one of the other programs, PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, we utilized the SBA. And it wasn't a perfect place to do this, but it was our theory, and I think it turned out to be true, a better place than something new that would require new rules, regulations, and bureaucracy. So the goal of getting money to, to people quickly, people who were unemployed, people who were uh, underemployed, businesses that were going out of business, timeliness in my view was, was hugely critical to keep the relationship going and to help people as, as, as quickly as possible. And unemployment insurance became a place that it was believed we could be helpful. Um, but the vote, uh, I was on the losing side of a vote on the $600. I recognize that it's difficult, I'm sure, to live on uh, unemployment insurance benefits, but it was, the $600 was ill thought out in the sense that it, it allowed people to get higher income levels, more, more income than what they were making, and therefore created a disincentive for people to return to work. That then had a consequence on the PPP uh, program, because of the loan uh, repayment program requires your employees to, to be at work or to return to work. So we've, we've worked to try to solve that problem. I think your question was, will there be an extension? And I would, I don't know how to answer that question. It's hard to predict here. Uh, it has strong support, but I think there's an effort to try to get us to the point in which the, if there is additional uh, unemployment benefits, the $600 in this case, that it be done in a way that doesn't put a person at a higher wage than what they were making before they became unemployed and therefore in, in, encourage people to return to work. I, uh, two things I would add to that. One is just uh, me and probably doesn't matter much. I was hoping and believe that this may not be the challenge that it has become in some instances as I have this Norman Rockwellian view of Kansans that given the opportunity to go to work, uh, they will do so. Uh, on the other hand, I recognize with all the challenges, financial, kids at home, saving to pay off debt, whatever it is, people have, that the $600 is very valuable to them. And so uh, we have to find the right mix of how we do that. And then secondly, unemployment insurance, as I understand it, again, this is state law, not federal law, but if you are offered a job and you don't accept it, then you're not entitled to unemployment insurance. And so there is another route by which this could be uh, handled and, and improved on. But my understanding is that because this, the State Department of Labor, the Kansas Department of Labor, is so overwhelmed with 
providing the benefits, but there's probably not the personnel to do the work to, to deny somebody unemployment if they refused a job. So it's perhaps not a practical solution. We're back to trying to make certain that Congress doesn't do something again that, um, that diminishes the chance, re increases the disincentive to go to work. Oh, you're absolutely correct on the Department of Labor. I mean, the numbers they've had have just been amazing for, for the claims and, and the, the ability to process that. So that certainly played a role. Um, you know, specific to the PPP program, uh, it, it was very, very popular, as you're well aware. Um, there's a couple of uh, large nonprofits on here that were not eligible because they're over that 500 person threshold and even some C6s that were not qualified. Do you see any relief for them coming in, in future packages? Well, I am for relief for them coming in future pra uh, packages. And I would say that it is something that is certainly possible to achieve. So it's not, it's not a just wishful thinking for me as an advocate for that or for the not-for-profits that are on the call today and others who wish they could be included in the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, first of all, when we were in the process of passing the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, I and a number of my colleagues insisted, encouraged, uh, ask about, are we going to include not-for-profits with the desire that the answer to that question be yes. We were assured that not-for-profits would be and were included in the PPP program. It turned out that is somewhat true statement, but not totally. And the truth is that we included 501c3s, which makes a lot of sense. That's the ones we think of as charitable organizations, I think, most readily. But it also included, uh, I think it's 11s or 14s, was the veterans organizations. But it, just, it did not include the others. Uh, and from a chamber point of view, we would indicate to Tracy and, and your team that we are fully engaged in, in lobbying for 501c6s to be included. Uh, chambers of Commerce. In, in many communities across Kansas, uh, and I'm sure it's true in Overland Park, the chamber has been front and center in helping their members access the programs to get them to the right people, to help figure out what the rules are, to provide information, to connect them with a banker. So the chamber, it would be an odd one to exclude uh, in the, this circumstance. They're, they're playing a significant role. But your question, or the question is really broader than that, I'm of the view that even larger not-for-profits, more than 500 employees, that's the threshold for the PPP program. Uh, in fact, uh, it's probably been three weeks now we had the Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary Mnuchin in front of the Banking Commember, uh, Committee, of which uh, I'm a member. And um, it was in the five minutes that you get to ask a question or questions, one of my three questions uh, said with a very rapid uh, speed of, of voice, uh, is what can we do to get you to, to interpret? Uh, and I think this is when the question was about, will it, they be included in phase four? There's also a belief that there is a way for uh, the Treasury Department and the SBA to interpret the rules, the law, to include larger uh, charitable organizations beyond the, including 501c3s that have more than 500 employees. And the distinction or the, the, the ability to do that is related to the other criteria uh, about uh, not just number of employees, but also income levels. And so most of our not-for-profits don't have high income levels and they may qualify if the Treasury would interpret it or the SBA and Treasury would interpret their rules. Uh, and we are engaged, uh, I started to say daily, maybe every other day in trying to get the Treasury to address this issue. And if they don't, or even if they do, to address it legislatively uh, as well. I'm, I've been involved in a, a number of uh, organizations, charities, and one of them that comes to mind is, is Alzheimer's. They're an example of where they have too many employees but don't make any money, and for them to have to lay off their employees without uh, the capability of connecting with uh, the PPP program, uh, it, it makes no sense to me. We ought to be more helpful than that. And we, we went through this with, with hospitals in Kansas uh, in which certain hospitals were excluded based upon how they were categorized. Uh, and we were successful in getting that changed. So there is precedent. We'll stay at it. It seems the right thing. In my view, it seems the right thing to do. 
Well, thank you for that. And, and before I uh, get too far away from the nonprofit questions, we had another one uh, sort of off the PPP program, but related to uh, oral chemotherapy and uh, whether that should be covered uh, as like uh, traditional IV chemotherapy. So could you address that before we move on? Uh, absolutely. This is, a, this is a piece of legislation that I introduced. I'm obviously for it. Um, and uh, supported by, I mean, who, who brings this issue to me are uh, those involved in, in cancer research, cancer treatment, and, and victims of, 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 and survivors of cancer. <clears throat> and it is uh, the traditional kind of way and the reimbursement under uh, federal mm -hmm. Medicare programs is for the IV treatment as compared to the oral. It is, much, it is less expensive to, to be treated orally. The medical providers and scientists tell me that the efficacy of that treatment is the same. Uh, and we just want to get this, we, before COVID-19, unrelated to the pandemic, we were trying to get this piece of legislation passed. Uh, along comes COVID-19 and we see that as our opportunity to include it in one of the phases that we've already uh, passed. When, when, and we were, I guess the point being there is we were unsuccessful and the argument has been that it was not related to COVID. One of the reasons we've been able to hold Republicans and Democrats together is that we have done a significant effort with pretty good success of not dealing with issues that are not related to treating or the consequences of COVID. I think this one's clearly related to COVID, keeping people from having to, at that time, having to go to, to a treatment center, a cancer treatment center or to the doctor's office, uh, when we were telling people to stay away, stay home, clearly COVID related, but we never got past a couple of the leaders in the Senate in that regard. And so we're back trying to do that. The folks on this call and others, uh, if they could get their state, their states, I mean, I, I assume I'm talking mostly to Kansans, but if you're involved in this effort of, of particularly issues related to cancer and you're involved in a national organization, if you can get your uh, your friends who have the same interest to talk to their other to my colleagues, other senators from other states. Same way with House members, we we need just greater uh, political support from members of the Senate, and that is certainly helpful. And they also need to be saying that this is related to taking care of people uh, during COVID nineteen uh, health consequences. So uh, we have not succeeded in getting it passed. It's a bill that. I can't find people who think it doesn't make a lot of sense, but even when legislation, legislative proposals make a lot of sense, it's still not a given that they get passed in the United States Senate or the House of Representatives and signed by a president. So I just, I'd say, Kevin, as you would understand, I just need more political support from more members of Congress to get this done. Well, I suspect you'll be hearing from the, uh, the nonprofit that's engaged in that effort. So uh, thank you for that answer. And, I'm going to take us back more towards the, the economy. Um, I thought this was a really interesting question. Do you support automatic stabilizers that would increase or decrease economic stimulus to individuals and businesses when economic conditions worsen or improve? You know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know exactly what those uh, automatic uh, things would be or how they would work. But just as a general matter, I would be reluctant to put things on autopilot. While Congress doesn't do its job perfectly, we need to be able to respond to the circumstances as they present themselves and acquire input from our constituents and our understanding of what's going on in our constituents' lives, their businesses, their communities. Uh, I, would, uh, I would think a better answer is for us to respond as needed assuming that we can get Congress to, to respond, although uh, in, in a timely fashion. I'm reluctant to have spending occur on an automatic basis. Uh, as I said previously, we, are, we, we spend a lot of money here, money that we don't have, money that someday those who are lending it to us have to be repaid. And to add one more thing that just happens automatically troubles me. But if the, if the questioner is, is somebody that's supportive of that concept, I, I just need to know a lot more than what that, uh, what that question tells me. Well, hopefully they'll follow up with you and provide you the, the details on that. Um, Great. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, specific support for businesses and, and other entities. 
what's your thought about federal government providing uh, financial support to state and local governments as they try to navigate these uh, uncertain waters? Well, Kevin, uh, first of all, I'd start with the reminder that the, 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 the taxpayers, I always try not to say federal dollars or federal money, taxpayer money, borrowers money, future taxpayers money has been provided to states and to local units of government. <clears throat> As you would know in Johnson County, uh, about a little over $100 million was provided uh, in the CARES Act to Johnson County. Uh, as well as to Sedgwick County, the two counties in our state that have population levels more than 500,000. Um, the state of Kansas received uh, $1.25 billion, uh, less the two amounts, both Sedgwick and, and Johnson got approximately 100,000, I'm sorry, $100 million. And so less the $200 million, Kansas received $1.25 billion. Um, and I'm not trying to in, engage myself in a political battle, and I don't know exactly what the what the veto session or the, uh, the when when the governor called the legislature back what they resolved. But and I, as I understand it, there's going to be input from legislators in regard to how the state's money is spent. Uh, and I do know that there are states who have concluded that that money uh, should be shared with local units of government. I think your neighbor to the east has made that decision, and I don't know what the governor and the state legislature will decide in Kansas. I do know that the money, while I'm working to see that the money that we have provided, Johnson County, for example, and the state of Kansas has more flexibility, can be used in broader ways than what the current law allows. Um, I would guess that, again, I, I'm saying something that I don't know exactly to be true, but my guess is that the, the $1.25 billion nearly that comes to Kansas currently can only be spent to pay for things related to COVID-19. And generally that means overtime, it means PPE, it means tests. I can't imagine that's $1.25 billion. And therefore how Kansas decides how to spend that may include states and, I'm sorry, may, may include local units of government, I don't know. Secondly, I'm sorry for a long answer, and I, in some ways I, sound, I think I'm being defensive. So one, we've given a lot of money, and two, in addition to the, to the Johnson County, fi uh, because they had population of 500,000 and the money that went to the state of Kansas, there's lots of things that have come to local units of government through the CARES Act, through our response. Uh, money for, I, I've, I've called the, the sheriff's office in Johnson County and the uh, Police Department, a number of communities, I was trying to think of it includes Overland Park, with grants that have been given to, to police departments and sheriff's departments across our state to help pay for the cost of COVID-19. Grants to public health departments, uh, grants to, to, uh, uh, to uh, airports uh, across Kansas. Uh, and so there are other ways that money are, uh, taxpayer dollars is being spent by local units of government. The question that I assume is the, is the biggest one is, are we going to do that in a broad and bigger scale than what's been done to date? And my guess is there will be assistance to local units of government. Uh, I, my, the, the, one, the, the one caveat, the, and I've said this numerous times, I am not interested in Kansas taxpayers uh, bailing out uh, communities or states who, for, who through their own poor fiscal mismanagement, maybe it's poor fiscal management, have uh, put themselves in a terrible financial circumstance and have lots of debt. This ought not be anything that is unrelated to the economic consequences of COVID. We're not trying to solve all the problems of every community who has mismanaged their spending. So uh, I had a conversation with a police chief of one of our communities, one of our larger communities in Kansas, just within the last week, and I was indicating in this conversation uh, about will there be more money for local units of government? And mostly what I think city managers and mayors, and uh, I've had this conversation with Mayor Gerlach, are interested in how do we recover from lack of, lack of revenue? It is a reminder to me in all the things that we talk about in, in trying to solve the country and the state's economic problems is we need people back to work responsibly. I'm not suggesting anything other than that, but we cannot afford to, to take care of all the economic problems that have been created by COVID-19 if people are uh, 
ad infinitum at, at, into the future at home. Businesses have to be doing business and employees have to be working for us to have a recovery. There isn't all the money in, I used to say, it used to be the expression, all the money in China. I don't know whether that's still an accurate expression or not, but all the money out there isn't, isn't sufficient for us to have a country that is a solid, uh, prosperous communities uh, based upon government programs. So the questions that mayors and city managers and county administrators have is, will you help with the lack of revenue? And I am willing to listen to the, the, the debate and discussion about that, as I've indicated to your mayor. And the, what I wanted to point out about the, the police chief telling me is, I said, you know, I'm gonna work to, to, to try to solve the department's, its challenges with its finances. It bothers me every time I see a, a story that a community is furloughed or laid off a police officer. Uh, that seems to me to be something that we ought to try to avoid. A fire department, uh, a, you know, fire chief, uh, fire department employees, um, uh, ambulance personnel, emergency personnel. It seems to me there are things that are so important that we ought to step in. But I learned something in the conversation, which was, well, we appreciate the support for our police department. But if the library is not open, if there's no rec, uh, uh, rec program for our kids, um, if there's no school, all those things uh, contribute to our ability to combat crime and to have a better community. You can't solve everything just by making sure that the police department is working. You need to make sure all the other programs that care for our community are up and running as well. And so I'm, I'm sorting a bit of this out and if the mayor was on a call with us, uh, I, I would be listening to him one more time about this topic. Well, we're hopeful he might be able to join. He had a conflict, as you're well aware, but there's a chance if that finished early, he might join us. So we'll see what happens. Well, here. well before he, if he joins us, before he gets, gets here, I'll say, I, oh, I hope not. <laughs> um, I'm going to wrap up the section on the PPP and the economic input with, with a couple of final questions. Uh, and these, I think, are consistent themes we've heard in talking to our members. What can be done to speed up decisions and funding on small business loans? Because um, there's so many businesses that are just really hanging in the lurch if they can't move this process along. And then uh, also a concern that some of those first loans went to very large corporations. So you want to want to address that before we move on? Sure, Kevin. Um... I indicated this earlier, and I mean, I knew when we created the PPP program through the SBA that there were going to be problems. And the question becomes, are the problems worth having in order to get a program that is up and running more quickly? My conclusion was yes. Knowing that there's going to be things that my constituents or the press or media are going to, my constituents are going to complain about, the press and media are going to write about, um, that don't look good and aren't good, it's still valuable to use the SBA and to get the program in, in play, in process, more quickly than we otherwise would. I, I can tell you of a business in Johnson County, I don't know what, what part of the, of the uh, city's line, whether it's north or south, east or west of the Overland Park boundaries, but I can tell you of a, I just was calling business owners and a bunch of other folks as we were trying to figure out what to do and one of them is a johnson county business person and i was explaining to him about the ppp program i thought this was going to pass we were getting close it seems to me that within the next week that we may have something like this program and his response to me was i mean i called him out of the blue i hope that i mean i hope that happens but i can tell you i have enough if you telling me this today, I was sitting here uh, trying to figure out which employees to furlough or to lay off. But if you tell me that we're going to have a program like that, I'm going to leave my employees on the payroll uh, and we'll, we'll see if this uh, comes to fruition. I'm delaying uh, furloughing employees. And that wasn't just, uh, I use that one as an example because I know it was Johnson County, but it happened numerous times in other calls. And it was, a, it was convincing to me that moving quickly was determining whether or not somebody had a job the next day. So yes, there are problems. Uh, it kind of, I mean, big businesses, I'm, I'm reluctant to say this, I do not want any business that did not qualify for PPP 
to get money from PPP and squeeze somebody out that did qualify. And certainly there is a 500 uh, employee threshold. But it does sometimes trouble me that we attack the idea that big business could need help. There are other programs to do that. It's not necessarily PPP. But as I listen to people, it doesn't really matter whether their son or daughter works for a works for a large company in Johnson County or works for a small business in Johnson County, the threat of losing their job is the same thing and the consequences of losing the job is the same thing. Maybe you can make the case that a larger business has more resources to, to, to recover, but the goal with this program, perhaps unlike just a grant to a business, the goal to this program was to keep employees employed. Sometimes, many times, I think Republicans get accused, uh, me as a Republican would get accused of of only caring about business. This program, PPP, really had the employee in mind, keeping the relationship going, allowing employees to, to draw a paycheck from their employer, even though they may not be at work or even when they couldn't work. And so really, whether that person works for a company that has 1,000 employees or 500 employees, there's a lot of desire on my part to keep employees employed, people with a paycheck. So perhaps that's a bit of an aside to the story. Again, I, I wouldn't want to be any, any suggestion that I'm tr suggesting that anybody who didn't qualify uh, should have gotten, we should have looked the other way and allowed them to, to, to get the money. And those who didn't qualify, I'm glad that they returned the money. I do feel sorry because I know a number of Kansas companies, including some in Johnson County, got nervous uh, with all the uncertainty out there and uh, gave back the loan proceeds that they probably clearly could have used but were uncertain about the public reaction or whether the loan was going to be forgiven. And that'd be part of my answer to the question is, one of the things that we were successful in doing, I think we had a couple of, of members of our staff, uh, my banking, I serve on the banking committee as I indicated earlier, we have a relationship with the Treasury Department. Treasury was really in a sense, guiding the SBA in this program. And we were able to get a, a frequently asked question answered that I think calmed a lot of fears about whether or not the loan would be repaid, and that is there is a safe harbor, uh, I didn't say that right, whether the loan would be forgiven. Uh, there's a safe harbor for audits, legal challenges to the loan, if the loan was, was less than $2 million. Uh, and that kind of, in my view, calmed the water of the politics and kind of attack on this program when businesses that were legitimately entitled to participate in the program got nervous about, pro, about, about participating. And that was, you know, some of our bankers and many of our CPAs who were advising their business clients caused them, I don't mean needlessly, but it's just the talk caused them to uh, have a, some doubts about the program and we needed some certainty. What we all need in business today, what we need in life is a lot more certainty than what we have. So the, the program had its flaws. We got to the point in which the SBA had never dealt with farmers, they'd never dealt with independent uh, contractors, and they'd never dealt with, built, uh, dealt with sole proprietors. So we created a whole new uh, opportunity for them to make loans to entities that they had no relationship, no past experience with. We asked the SBA to, uh, in the first tranche of money, to provide loans of $350 billion in two weeks, and it's an agency that deals with $30 billion of loans in a year. We had computer problems. We got us to the point, this program was utilized by credit unions and banks. I know that a month or more ago, the number of banks in Kansas, all but nine were participating in the program. Um, it put more than $5 billion into the Kansas economy, $5 billion worth of loans, uh, and um, nearly 50,000 Kansas businesses participated in the PPP program. So despite its flaws, I think it had a lot of, you indicated it was popular, I think it had a lot of, of, of benefits. We're trying to get more answers from Treasury and from the SBA to satisfy <clears throat> the problems, but we have seen independent contractors, sole proprietors uh, getting their loans approved. And it, to me, kind of evidence of that, this might be of the, the number, this, these numbers might be of interest. The original $350 billion worth of loans, the average loan, in Kansas was $189,000. Uh, in the second set of money, the 310 billion, that dropped to like $48,000. Uh, 
that suggests to me that we were getting to the small businesses and we were getting to sole proprietors. We're getting to the beauty shop and the stylists and the nail uh, salons, the things that had really been struggling into get it, getting into the program. Well, thank you, Senator. And I know we've got a very short amount of time left, so we'll move into the lightning round and close out with a few uh, questions. One of them, um, there was some legislation apparently introduced this morning regarding police reform. Uh, the question was, were you aware of that? And do you have any opinions on that legislation yet? Well, <clears throat> Kevin, you are the most uh, polite uh, host. I, I don't know anybody has ever used the phrase lightning round with me in order to get me to shorten my answers. It was a very good technique. I just want you to know that I picked up on it. Um, I do know legislation has been introduced. I do not know its details. Um, I had a, uh, a Zoom conference with uh, uh, police chiefs and sheriffs and county sheriffs across Kansas. Uh, un unintended, I mean, the, the, the circumstance in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and now across the country occurred after we had scheduled the, the conversation. Mostly I wanted to hear from them about how they were reacting to the COVID circumstances. <clears throat> but we had a conversation and I can tell you that uh, every, uh, every conversation that occurred during that call was critical of what happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota by, uh, by law enforcement there. And a commitment on the behalf of Kansas uh, police chiefs and uh, sheriffs, police officers, law enforcement officers, to, to do better and to weed out the, 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 the behavior that uh, occurs. Um, and I would say that we are involved in, I mean, when I was indicating earlier, I, I'm involved in the funding of the Department of Justice. Uh, a, a component of that funding is grants to local law enforcement. And we've been working in the last, I've only had this chairmanship for uh, the last uh, year and a half or two. And we've increased the amount of funding for community policing, for, law, for grants to local units of government, for community policing, for law enforcement officers in schools, uh, for community relations. Uh, again, we have a long way to go to make things where they ought to be, but we have every moral and every moral responsibility to make sure that we do more, listen, learn, act, uh, for things that are clearly troublesome to, to me and to Americans. Well, thank you. And, and another uh, big uh, change in gears here, this, we're going to go to the World Health Organization and your thoughts about, uh, do you support uh, the, the president's uh, thoughts of pulling out of that or what's your take on that? Well, my, my, my take would be, it doesn't seem to me that the World Health Organization conducted itself well. Uh, and I, I'm not unfamiliar with the, with the allegations about the relationship with China. But it seems to me that in times of a pandemic, the, the goal would be to work with the world community to reform and correct the mistakes, to change the leadership if that's the problem. But um, America needs to play a leadership role in combating pandemics. Going back to what I said earlier, uh, again, we have a thought as Americans that bad things happen someplace else. And we live in a world in which uh, something that occurs halfway around the globe comes back pretty quickly to have a consequence to us. So I would, uh, I, I, I'm, I would guess that we will soon have a hearing. That expect, it's expected we'll soon have a hearing on this topic on a committee that I'm in. Uh, I'm a committee, on a committee I'm a member of. And I would be interested in hearing the debate. But my general reaction just broadly is, we need to engage in the world, we can't withdraw. It's to our benefit. It's not that we're just taking care of other people in the, around the world. In doing so, we are taking care of ourselves and we need to provide leadership. And rather than walking away and allowing China to, to have more influence in an organization that we're in, why don't we increase our influence in that organization? Thank you. And, and I'm going to close it out with one final question, everybody's favorite subject to tort reform. Uh, what, what do you think about uh, liability protections for businesses as they're reopening and, and struggling with some of the uh, lasting impacts of the COVID pandemic? Kevin, um, 
it has to happen. It's necessary. Uh, the Senate Majority Leader has indicated that to pass a phase four, uh, part of part of the uh, to pass legislation under phase four, it will need to include li liability protection. And I just would say that what to reiterate what I said earlier, we need less uncertainty for business to I mean for people to go out and uh, participate in the economy. They need to know that they're they are healthy and they're going to remain healthy. For a business to, to re-up uh, their game and go back to work and to compete uh, in the economy, they need to know that they have some certainty about the, the rules on which they're playing and the uncertainty that comes with uh, lack of liability protections. It may, de it may defeat all the effort that we've had. If, if, if that's not included, it may defeat much of the effort that we've had in trying to get the economy going uh, through the grants, through PPP and other programs. Uh, that is, it is, it is hugely important. Well, Senator, that's it for the questions I have. Uh, I always appreciate uh, hearing from you and your input, and uh, I'll close it out with uh, turn it over to Tracy. Great, thanks, Kevin, and and thank you, Senator. And I thought everyone's favorite subject was Highway 69. I didn't know that it was tort reform, um, so I'm going to have to revise all of my scripting. Um, but we do appreciate your position on tort reform uh, because while it, it may not be my favorite topic, but it, it is a, a very high priority for our businesses. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time working on it in, uh, in the regular session, the special session of the Kansas legislature. But I think everyone knows that it, it is a particularly important issue to address on the national level. And so um, we, we really do appreciate your position on that. So Tracy, I can I can I respond so that you don't get the last word on Highway 69? I was going to give you the opportunity to ah, have the last word on Highway 69. So thank you. Um, I know how important uh, Highway 69 is to Overland Park, to Johnson County, to Southern Johnson County. I've traveled. Uh, I I mean, I try to avoid coming from the south at 4:30 or 6 o'clock, uh, coming from the from the north or south in most most parts of the day, and um, we want, we are, we've tried to be helpful. Um, and the, the challenge we have is that the decisions of where money is spent on transportation projects is almost exclusively the Kansas Department of Transportation. The exception to that is uh, build grants. There's been various administrations have had different names for some amount of money that can be given to, to kind of jumpstart or assist a project. And we have supported uh, the Highway 69 project for uh, Overland Park and for Johnson County for Eastern Kansas. It hasn't been approved yet, but we are in the game and still uh, we have a good relationship. I have served or serve on almost every committee that deals with infrastructure, highways, roads, and bridges. And uh, we have a good relationship with the, US with the U.S. Transportation Department, and we're working to try to make sure that the, that application, those applications get the, the, the justice that, uh, the, the attention that they deserve. Um, the other thing that we can do, and it is somewhat related to, to COVID-19, President Trump and uh, particularly House Democrats are interested in an infrastructure program within the, the next phase or the next phase. If we're going to do highways, roads and bridges and a whole bunch of other infrastructure at some point in time, and in my view, it's needed sooner rather than later. It would be a good time to do it now. If we're gonna spend the money anyway, spend it when we can use the boost to our economy and more people who are unemployed would be employed. So there is an, an opportunity and what, I guess my bottom line, whenever it happens, our goal will be to get the most amount of money we can to Kansas so they can make decisions that allow the Kansas Department of Transportation to put Kansas dollars into that project as well, because you can't build it just with a with a federal grant. It takes significant amounts of money. The uh, Overland Park and others are willing to put some money in, but it really takes a Kansas commitment and the resources to do it. Well, we certainly understand and appreciate that. We appreciate everything that you and your entire staff have done to help position us to be in the in the right place um, when the right time comes and. And as you said, we think that there might be um, the right time coming when some federal dollars are allocated and um, the state of Kansas announced when we were all um, staying at home. And um, it, it probably wasn't um, the best timing because I think it might have gotten lost a little bit uh, in, in all of the other things that, that were happening um, at the time. But 
um, US 69 was named um, the top state priority. And so, um, you know, for a whole lot of reasons that we don't have to reiterate on this call, um, but I think that um, certainly positions this project well, you know, it tells everyone what we already knew um, about um, both the maintenance level of, um, of that highway, uh, but also the safety priority um, that we all have for our, our businesses and, and for our families. Um, so, you know, we, we just appreciate so much your support on that. And um, I know you'll be um, hearing from us when um, the right opportunity comes. I, I know that too. <laughs> I, I know you, you just uh, know that we know all of your numbers, so um, we'll, be, we'll be contacting you. Tracy, uh, so, I want to ask Alex if he wants to say anything to correct my yes. errors. Alex, anything that I misspoke that you'd no, like to... No, make? sir. You're, I, I, I don't think you had any errors today. Oh, or wait till we get off the line. <laughs> today. <laughs> today. <laughs> Alex Very didn't good. even look nervous, not one time, so it was a good day. Good. Well, thank you both. Um, Alex, it's always a, a pleasure to see you. And uh, Jerry, you know, we don't get to see you often enough anymore, but we know that you're working hard. Um, you know, we have um, been uh, particularly um, pleased. Um, many of our businesses, as you said, um, the first three and a half phases, um, you know, there's um, something that everyone likes. There's something that everyone wishes was different. And, you know, that certainly is probably a sign of, of great legislation. Um, but the bottom line is that we know that there are people, um, our businesses that have been particularly helped by pieces um, that are in each one of those um, acts. And um, that's important to make sure that our economy um, uh, stays stable um, through this very um, uncertain time. And, and you nailed it when you said that businesses need certainty in order to move forward. And, and we haven't had a lot of that lately. So, you know, we'll be looking forward to uh, phase four. We know that, that you're very much in the middle of that right now, and, and we're happy to provide input as you move forward on that. Um, we're um, in communication with the U.S. Chamber several times a week as um, those negotiations move back and forth. And so don't hesitate to call on us if you want to um, get information from our members about what they're thinking and feeling, you know, as they continue to open um, further. Um, we're happy to help provide that, but we just want to thank you so much for working hard on our behalf and uh, for being uh, available to us uh, to have this open dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, you and Kevin, for the, uh, the, the conversation this afternoon and to all your members. Uh, thanks for participating. And if there's anything that you didn't get a chance to ask, reach out to me, reach out to Alex. Uh, and uh, if there's something, I mean, the, the bottom line is, uh, is how can I help? What, what can we do to help you? Make sure we know that, and we'll do uh, everything that we can to make sure that good results occur. Absolutely. We'll stay safe in Washington. Uh, thank you. Thank you all uh, very much. Thank you to all of our members for participating. Please, if you have any uh, questions um, that did not get answered that uh, you would like to uh, reach out to uh, the senator and his team, please let us know. If you don't have the uh, contact information that you need, or if you would like to reach out to um, any of us here on the staff team, uh, you have our contact information. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, we are adjourned. We will see you soon. Have a great rest of the week. Bye, everybody. Bye.